What does it take to, to be in charge of your destiny? What do you have going for you? What is it that you have going for you right now that's a real plus for you? What is it that you have going against you? What kind of tra training do you require? What is it that you need to learn? Don't worry about the fact that you don't have all the things you need in order to make it happen. Decide that you're going to do something about it. Become an active force in your life. Most people go through life never using the power they have. If you don't use your talents, if you don't use this power, this force that you have within you, you're going to lose it. As you begin to look at life, as you begin to look at the things you want to do, decide that you're going to become the active force in your life. If you view all of the things that happen to you as an opportunity, now you become an active force in your life. Now you are the one, rather than running from things as they begin to change, you become a change driver because you know that you've got the power within you to make the difference. This force, this power, this energy that you have, that's more powerful than anything that can ever happen to you. How are you feeling this evening? Great. Whenever somebody asks me how I'm doing, I always say better than good and better than most. And that's what I like for you to say. How are you doing? Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you're doing better than good. <laughs> All right. You know, I like to say that because I believe that we are. We have a lot of things going for us that many of us don't realize and and many of us really never use all the things that we have going for us and ever act on the things that we'd like to act on. And consequently, most of us go through life sleepwalking never really discovering our true potential, never enjoying life to its full extent. And so, therefore, I think that there are some things that we need to begin to do to take charge of our destiny. How many of you like to take charge of your destiny? Raise your hand, please. Very good. All right. So we're going to do that. And, you know, one of the things that really stimulated this, I was with a friend of mine. We were riding back after I'd spoken to her company, and they had a major downsizing. Now they call it right-sizing when companies reduce the workforce for economic reasons. Well, at any rate, when we were on the plane and she said, um, you know, I'm no longer going to be with the company. And I said, no. I said, why? She said, well, uh, my division has been eliminated. I said, well, you do have another plan, don't you? And she said, no. I said, but didn't they have something of this nature about a year ago? She said, yes. I said, but did you start thinking that maybe perhaps you need to prepare to do that which you really wanted to do because this person that I've known for a long time always wanted to be involved in fashion design. So I said, haven't you been doing something on your, your fashion designing career? She said, no. I said, but what have you been doing? She says, hoping that nothing happened to me. I said, but hoping is not a process. <laughs> it's not a method. Uh, you, know, you know, a lot of people go through life like that. Now, that wasn't really what she wanted to do, but I do a training seminar, and one of the things we ask, what would you do if the unthinkable happens to you? What would you do if you had an accident, or you lost your job, or you were laid off, or you became ill? How would you provide for yourself if the unthinkable happens to you? And it doesn't always happen to the other person. It can happen to me, it can happen to you. But most of us go through life thinking that, well, just maybe it won't happen to me. That we'll just read about somebody else that will happen to us. Talking to a friend of mine by the name of Maria, who is wheelchair bound. And she said that she had an experience in her life that taught her that she's not immune from life because she was diagnosed as having muscular dystrophy at age 15. And she figured that was tra tragic enough. But two years ago, because of a malfunctioning wheelchair, she fell out of a van, struck her head, and suffered a closed head injury. Had blood on the brain, and they said that she perhaps might go blind or she have loss of memory or concentration. And I said, how did you handle that? She said, Les, it was the best thing that could have happened to me. I said, why? She said, because on that day, I woke up and I realized that life is about today. Living today, that whatever I want to do, I do it right now. She said, I enjoy getting up in the morning, looking out of the window, just looking at the grass. She said, because I could have lost my vision. She said, I'm appreciative of just the little things. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, be thankful for the little things. Isn't that important? 
But we've got to begin to learn how to become thankful for the little things and live in life right now. So I want you to think about your ideas. All of us have ideas and things that we have not acted on. I want you to just think about them right now. Um, E.L. Simpson said that an idea should be like a, a pin. You know, that a pin that you sit on and, and you jump up right away to do something with it. <laughs> So I don't want you to just think about it. I want when you leave here, I want you to jump and do something with it, all right? <laughs> now, so think about this idea. What does it take to, to be in charge of your destiny? Well, you got to begin to develop some skills, and you got to ask yourself a question. Um, what do you have going for you? What is it that you have going for you right now that's a real plus for you? What is it that you have going against you? What kind of tra training do you require? What is it that you need to learn? See, you, you make money only one of three ways in an economy of this nature. You have to have a skill, like I've developed the skill to become a speaker, or have some specialized knowledge, or have a particular product that, or service that you can provide for the public. John H. Johnson of Ebony Magazine said something very important. He says, there is no defense against an excellence that meets a pressing public need. So any idea that you have, it must fulfill a need for somebody. Why don't you think about it? Now here's the next step. Don't worry about the fact that you don't have all the things you need in order to make it happen. Decide that you're going to do something about it. Become an active force in your life. See, you've got some talents and abilities right now you have that if you don't challenge yourself to use those talents and abilities, you'll never ever discover the full effect that they can have on achieving all the things that you want to achieve. Most people go through life never using the power they have. You have enormous power to begin to create all the things that you want in your life experience that most people go through life never using. I travel a lot speaking around the country and I was out of Detroit for around two months. I came back to the airport, went in the parking lot, put my key in the ignition, turned the key, can anybody tell me what happened? <laughs> can you tell me why the car did not get started? The battery was dead, why was it dead? I had not been using it. Repeat after me, please. If you don't use it, you, don't use it. You, lose it. you lose it. See, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't use your talents, if you don't use this power, this force that you have within you, you're going to lose it. If you have the ability to write, and if you don't write, you're going to lose the ability to write as well as you do right now. If you have the ability to play an instrument, the world's greatest pianist said that if I miss a week of practice, I know it. And if I miss two weeks, the critics know it. And if I miss three weeks, my audience knows it. If you have the ability to, to draw well, and if you don't use that talent eventually, you're going to lose it. If I don't speak often, and I one time at one point in my life, I missed speaking for around six months. And when I came up before an audience, I was rusty. I could not get my thoughts together. I could not have the power, the, the kind of confidence that I needed in order to make it happen. So whatever you want to do, whatever idea that you have, the longer that you're sitting on that idea, you are either creating or you are disintegrating. If you're not using it, your skills are diminishing every day. And there goes a second. There goes another second. And life is happening right now. But Les, what do you mean? Get your butt out of the way. So many people have gone to their graves, never discovered their true potentials because they allow their butts to stop them. Like, but I don't know what to do. No, that's not really true. I was on a television program the other day. A lady called in and she said, um, there's something I'd like to ask you. And I said, what is it? She said, well, I have this, this thing I want to do, but I've been unemployed. I lost my job for two years. I haven't been able to find a job. I don't have the money and I don't have the contacts and, and I really don't know what to do. I said, excuse me. I said, the fact that you don't have the money or the contacts really is not the issue. I said, what's the real issue? She said, what do you mean? I said, what's stopping you from doing what you want to do? She said, well, I, I don't know. I said, but if you did know, what would your answer be? She said, well, I, I think maybe I'm afraid. I said, what are you afraid of? Maybe I might fail. See, a lot of people allow fear to stop them from living their dream. Answer your calling, whatever you're called to do. Don't count yourself out. Don't say, I can't do that. Many of us go through life saying no, and you don't even know what you're saying no to. You don't know what you cannot do if you're not willing to challenge yourself. Whatever it is that you don't know how to do right now, you can learn. 
I did not know how to speak for major corporations. I didn't know how to do that. But I decided to become a student. If you do your research, if you do your homework, if you make the commitment that I'm going to learn, when you look at what do I have going for me and drop your buckets where you are, decide I'm going to work and get myself together. A guy named Jim Rowan said, if you develop your gifts, your gifts will take you places that you'll never begin to imagine. And I decided to do one thing all my life. I've been a jack of all trades and master of none. I mean, I did a little of everything. I was a disc jockey. I was a state representative. I used to be an MC. I used to do public relations work. I used to do door-to-door -door sales. I did a whole lot of things, but I decided that I was going to do one thing and I would master that. And after mastering the art of speaking, then I would become a trainer. And after doing that, then I said, I must become a businessman. Just find one thing and just decide that you're gonna work with it until it gives you the blessing that you want and don't let up on it. Just keep right on working it and working it and working it and knowing that whatever you do, you can better your best, that you can get better at it, that whatever you are achieving right now, it's only a tip of the iceberg of what's possible for you. Now here's something else that you do when you start working on this dream. Give it everything you got. See, put your heart in it. Most people, when they're working on dreams, they don't give it everything they have. I heard a guy say in a book, the title of it was, All You Can Do Is All You Can Do. And all you can do is enough. Well, see, most people don't do all they can do. Most people go through life holding back. Have you ever had the experience of starting your car and you mash down on the accelerator and the car, boom, wait a minute, hold a minute. Start mashing again and, and it was not moving, it was very hot, and all of a sudden you realize that you had the emergency brakes on? <laughs> How many of you ever had that experience? Raise your hand, all right. <laughs> then you release the emergency brakes and then a car move, boom, unencumbered. Most of us go through life with our emergency brakes on. Well, it might not work out. <laughs> People might talk about me. <laughs> I don't have enough money. <laughs> I don't have enough education. <laughs> I'm too ugly. <laughs> Take somebody's hand on your right and left and say, what you have is enough. <laughs> See, you know, there are two kinds of people, people in life. They're winners and whiners, you know. <laughs> Most people go through life just whining. I didn't have enough money. I didn't have good credit. They didn't like me, you know. <laughs> no, life is not about that. See, uh, the major key to your taking charge of your destiny is you. I mean, if you have the credit of Ross Perot, that will help, all right? If you got somebody to co-sign for you, that will help. <laughs> if you happen to be handsome, that will help, you know? Um, if you have people who will support you, that will help. But all of those things are secondary. The major key to your taking charge of your destiny is you. It's you. And even though you might not have all the things going for you that you would like, you have the power within you as you begin to develop your consciousness, as you hold the vision of what it is that you want to do, as you decide to enter this small voice within you. Because as you respond to this voice that's telling you you ought to do this, the way will come, ideas will come to you. You will begin to attract things you need and things that you don't even know that you need right now. You will develop the skills in the process as you look at yourself finding out what is it you need to do, what kind of adjustments you need to make, what new strategies that you need to begin to implement to make it happen. But if you don't put yourself out here, if you don't become actively involved in life, if you hold back on yourself and continue to procrastinate, when I saw a speaker who I said, I know if this guy can do this, I know I could do that. That was years after I had made the decision to do it. I was holding back on myself. I kept building up all kind of reasons and excuses to justify why I wasn't acting on my dream. Most people go through life as volunteer victims. They go through life volunteering to be victims, giving excuses on why they're not pursuing their greatness, giving excuses on why they're not doing the things that they want to do, putting it off again and again and again, wasting valuable time. Life is very valuable, ladies and gentlemen. Time is very valuable and it's very fragile. You've got to decide to do what you can right now and don't delay.
Live your, living your life like a sense of urgency. R repeat this, please, and tell somebody on your right and left. Live your life now. Be happy now. This is not a dress rehearsal. Do that, please. This is your Super Bowl. <laughs> Do you know there are people who put more emphasis and more energy into a sporting event or dancing or entertainment than they do on their dreams? They have more interest in who won a particular game than where they are in relationship to their goals and their ambitions and developing themselves. So you want to begin to get your priorities in order. Ask yourself the question, the people in my life right now, um, are they contributing to my growth and development? Are they making me a better person? What I'm doing right now, is it nourishing me? Does it empower me? Is it giving me what I need out of my life right now? Is it challenging to me? Is it making me stretch mentally and emotionally and spiritually? Is it getting the best out of me? See, this is the only life you've got. So you don't want to squander it doing something you don't want to do, feeling you can't do any better. You can do better. You should do better. You deserve to do better. You are entitled to that. That is your right to do better. So resolve that within yourself. Make it something in your life that you just won't compromise on. See, it is important to me that I be able to provide for my mother. That is not optional, to be able to provide for my children. There's a standard of living that I'm going to enjoy. It is not optional. It's not something that I would like to see happen. It's not something that it'll be okay. It's something that I value. And as you begin to look at your life, draw the line and say, hey, what is it that I need that can give me a sense of fulfillment? What is it that I need right now that I would enjoy that will give my life some music and some power? Decide that because you deserve that. But if you don't decide that and decide to make that happen, it will never happen for you. It will never happen for you. I did a training years ago, and after this particular seminar, I'll never forget a lady who was 85 years old. She stood up and we asked a question, anybody has anything brave to share? And she said, yes. She said, this was a very enriching seminar for me. It really opened my eyes. She said, I'm 85 years old. She said, all my life, she said, I sacrificed my dreams for everybody else, for my family, for my husband, for my children. She said, I've really ne never done anything for me of value of the things that I really find important. She said, I say to you young people, you won't be in my situation right now if you decide to live your life now. She said, if I had my life to live over, I would do things differently. She said, but I don't have it to live over. And when I go home, I got news for my husband. <laughs> So repeat after me, please. I'm going to live my life now. I'm going to live my life now. I deserve that. I deserve that. Okay, now, here's something else I want you to realize. Things are going to happen. You've just got to handle it. My goddaughter, Nika Williams, who lives in Columbus, Ohio, just this past week, three children in her neighborhood that she went to school with were sitting in a car talking. An intoxicated driver lost control of his vehicle and ran into that car and killed those three kids. The children that they went to school with experienced pain and grief and shock, but they came, became actively involved in putting together the funeral services. And I talked with her. I said, how are you doing, Anika? She said, I miss them. She said, but there's something that I realize, that many of the relationships we have in life, we take casually. And we don't say all the things that we really should say and do all the things with people that mean something to us that we really should do. And she said, I'm going to miss them. But it's really alerted me about how unpredictable life is. And so now she's going to become a very sharing person, more so than ever before, and all of the other young people that were involved. But they were handling it. And as you begin to look at your life, decide to handle things. When you decide that you want to begin to take control of your destiny, there are going to be some sacrifices that you're going to have to make. There will be things that you're going to have to decide, I've got to give this up. I've got to let this go. Many times you will have problems in your personal relationships. 
When I decided to become a motivational speaker, I was gone sometimes for weeks when I left home before coming back. And I'll never forget, I did a big major rally for a guy by the name of Dexter Yeager, a big Amway rally called Free Enterprise Day. And after speaking, people were chanting, we want the motivator, we want the motivator. Boy, I was excited. So I ran back to the phone after I came off stage and I called the young lady that I was dating then. I said, look, I said, I wiped them out. They love me. They're saying, we want the motivator. Listen, they're saying, we want the motivator. We want the motivator. So she said, Les, I need to tell you something. I said, what? And I heard a voice in the background said, hurry up and tell him. I said, who's that? She said, Les, you've been gone so long. I said, yes, yes, I've been working on a dream. And I'm sorry, the relationship is over. What? You got to be kidding me. I said, hang up. I said, wait. And I said, Mr. Motivator, come on. I said, hold a minute, wait. I said, Mr. Motivator, come down. I said, OK, OK. I went outside. I looked at the people. I said, you got to have a dream that's real big. <laughs> I say, sometimes things will happen to you that will get you on the blind side and bring you to your knees. <laughs> I went back to the hotel, but they had to pull me off stage. I was out there saying, you got to have a larger vision. You got to be hungry. They pulled me off. I said, and you got to stay motivated. <laughs> They said, come on, motivator. They were turning the lights off. The janitors wanted to go home. <laughs> I wanted to keep her off of me. <laughs> so they took me to the hotel. I was walking in the room trying to find the Gideon Bible. <laughs> and Lonely was sitting on the bed saying, how's your positive attitude? <laughs> how's your larger vision now? <laughs> I'm telling you, when this happens, think it not strange. You are going to cry. People are going to get bad with you. <laughs> People are going to start working against you. Your mate is going to get upset with you. Where are you going? I'm working on a dream. Uh-huh. <laughs> I got your dream. You ain't going to know it. <laughs> People are going to start going crazy on you. Becoming jealous and envious, that's a part of the program. Understand that. See, that's why a lot of people say, no, that's all right. I pass on the dream. That's all right. <laughs> I just keep on biting my nails, hope nothing don't happen. <laughs> but it's, it's an experience that that opposition, those obstacles that you will encounter, that's how you grow. That's how you become stronger. Now, will there be some tight moments? Will there be some times that you want to give up? Yes. Here's something I was reading that, that Harriet Beecher Storr says. She said, when you get into a tight spot and everything goes against you until it seems that you cannot hold on for a minute longer, never give up then, for that is just the place and time that the tide will turn. Never give up then, and that is so important. When you're working on doing the things you want to do and fulfilling your dream and things happen, there are times when your energy feels so depleted that you want to give up that it looks just totally impossible. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, don't give up then. That's when you've got to fall forward, when life is kicking dirt in your face. Don't give up then. That's when most people turn back. Most people will tuck their tails between their legs and they will run in the opposite direction and say, that's all right, life, I don't want this, all right? No, 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 if you've decided that this is what you want to do. You've got to become courageous to stand up within yourself, to face it and step forward. And ladies and gentlemen, that is what gives your life meaning. That those things will begin to strengthen you like you can never begin to imagine. And I tell you, one of the most painful experiences I had in my life was also one of the most enriching because they say that pain opens the space in the heart for joy. And because I did not buy into something, because I caught myself at a critical point and was able to back up and look at it, I was able to become free of the effects of what could have been a tragic situation for me and move on and do something about it. But I learned in the process that I had to learn to surrender and give certain things up. See, in life, everything that happens to you, there's a lesson in it. There's a lesson in it for you if you look at it 
whatever happens to you, just look at and, and view life that you're a student of the universe and say, what's in here for me to learn? One of the most tragic things that, that happened to me that could have been a tragedy was when I wanted to buy my mother a home, and I did that. And in my haste, and it was the first major purchase of property that I ever made in my life, and so I was naive. And so when we were sitting there at the closing, um, the attorney said, have you done a title search? And I said, what's a title search? And she said, well, that's when you check to see whether or not there are any liens against the property before you purchase it so that you don't inherit any financial obligations of the previous owner. So the guy interrupted, said, look here. He said, the only reason that I'm selling you this house and I'm doing it at a loss, I can actually make more money. But the only reason that I flew here from Philadelphia to sell you the house specifically is because I admire the fact that you're adopted and you want to buy this home for your mother. And he said, there are no liens on the property. I just want to help you. So I looked at my attorney. I said, I believe you. She said, Les, this is business. I'm not questioning his integrity, but I advise you not to sign the contract now. I looked at him. He said, if you're not going to do it, man, I'll just go ahead on and make the money that I was going to make. I said, okay, no, 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 no. I want to do it. I said, I'll do it. So she said, okay. She said, this is not the last house in the world. I signed the contract. After being in the house for around two months, I received a notice that I had to pay a lien of $25,000 or I had to get out of the house. I called the attorney. I said, look here, sir. I said, my name is Les Brown. I'm the new owner of this property. I said, I bought this home for my mother. I said, she's 80 years old. I said, she has a bad heart, a serious condition. I said, and I just cannot give up this home. And I just exhausted all of my resources to buy the house. It's all I have. I said, can we work out some kind of monthly payments? I don't know how much I can get, but if you can work with me, I guarantee I'll give you my word. I want to keep this home. I'll pay you back. He said, we want the money in six weeks or you have to get out of the house. It's going to go on the auction block. I said, oh, I said, but I borrowed everywhere I could just to get the $12,000 to put down on it. He said, mister, that's not my problem. You should have had a title search done. So I went back home and I worried for weeks. I lost around 23 pounds. I would go home to catch the mail so my mother wouldn't get it. They put a listing in the newspaper. People were driving around wanted to come in the house to look at it. So I put a, a, a sign out front saying that the newspaper article was an error, saying that the house was up for sale. And finally, when they were coming for the day they were going to auction it on the courthouse steps, I knew the moment of truth had come, I had to tell my mother. So I walked all night that night, around 2 o'clock in the morning. The children were asleep, my mother was asleep. I said, Lord, I said, why did this have to happen to me? I said, I'm trying to do the right thing. I, I want to provide for mom. I'm not out stealing and robbing. I want to provide for my children. I said, why did this have to happen to me? I was personalizing. I was feeling like a victim. And so finally, I, I had to go in there and I had to tell my mama. So I, I, I kneeled by the bed. I said, Mama, I've got something to tell you. She said, what? I said, we've got to move out the house. She said, why? I said, well, because of the fact that I made a mistake and I signed a contract when I should have had a title search done and I can't pay the $25,000 outstanding lien against it. She said, good, I don't like this house anyway. <laughs> I said, but you told me you did. She said, I just said that for you because you like me so much. She said, it's two story, baby, and the arthritis, I can't climb the steps. But you told me you could, mama. Oh, I just did that for you. I walked up the steps and I was in the room and said, that fool crazy with this house. <laughs> I said, oh, mama. So I'll never forget when we had to pack up and go back to the old house we had moved out of in Liberty City, right down the street from Miami Northwestern High School. And the neighbors were out looking. Isn't that Mamie's boy? And they're coming back. You know? <laughs> I was so embarrassed. I mean, I was, you know, I turned red, but couldn't nobody see it, you know? <laughs> you know? So my sister came over. She didn't make it any better. She went, mm-hmm. <laughs> Mixed the big time. Won't get no job going around and running your mouth. Yeah, you got a dream to get mama home. Now, 
you back where you belong here. We came in the house and the, rich, the roaches were playing bid whist. <laughs> they said, y'all come on in, we miss y'all. <laughs> and as I was taking furniture off the truck, I was so hurt and humiliated and I felt beaten. And I began to cry and I held my head down. And my mama said, hold your head up, boy. I said, mama, I just, I just can't, mama. She said, hold your head up and have nothing to be ashamed of. You did the best you could. Hold your head up. So I said, yes, ma'am, mama. So I was carrying the furniture in. And I had to give a lecture that week on forgiveness. <laughs> and I can't talk about anything unless I'm doing it myself. And I had to forgive and forget. Let it go so that I could grow. It took me time to work through that. But I did, and I was able to give the lecture. And to this day, I can't even remember the guy's name. But because I let it go, and I began to focus my energy in the now, later, I got a bigger and better home for my mama. Here's what I learned from that. That was not the last home in the world. There were other homes. Uh, I, if I had just been willing to just let it go, he who cares less wins. And a guy called and said, you got to get out of there. If this is what happened, I could have, I mean, through worry and stress, I could have had a heart attack over a house that my mama didn't even like. <laughs> Do you follow what I'm saying? So I, I now realize, hey, it's only things and it's okay, they are replaceable. I lost everything except my spirit and except the love of my mother and her respect and the respect of my children. Sure, people talked about me. Did they laugh? Yes. Did I feel humiliated? For a while, yes, I did. Embarrassed? Yes. And that's a part of it, but I didn't stay there. See, sometimes you just, you can wallow in it, you know, don't want to get, you get somebody pull you out feeling good. Oh, I want to go back again. You know? <laughs> no, no, don't wallow in self-pity. And there are people who will help you. You call them up and they'll give you a pity party, all right? No. I talked the other night about some explorers that were in Africa. And they saw these two little boys who were playing with some, what appeared to be marbles. And they went up to these little guys and said, here, let me give you some candy for that. Little fellas ate the candy and liked that. Said, can we have some more? I said, yes. But would you give me what you are playing with? And they said, yes. And they gave these shiny little rocks, so to speak, to the explorers. And the explorers, taking them back and examining them, discovered they were large size uncut diamonds. They had a fortune. The little boys had a fortune in their hands, but they didn't know. They did not know. Repeat after me, please. If we knew better, we, knew better. we would do better. We knew better. See, there are many of us, we work for, for people and sometimes put in 60 and 70 hours a week. Why? Because we have the ability the talents and the skills to contribute to the long-term growth and development and profitability of the company. Do we do that for ourselves? Oh, no, why? Well, we say, well, I've got security. <laughs> There's no such thing. It's an illusion in your mind. We go through life creating these illusions for ourselves. But it doesn't mean that you can't strategically work on something else on the side. Develop some hobby of passion and find ways that you can begin to create some alternative methods of providing wealth for yourself. See, you know, money is not important to me, like, but Rita Davenport said it's right up there with oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> but it is important to me that it not be important. I got that from Rhea Steele. That's important. It is important to me that it not be important. Make it important to you to live your dream. See, how many of you fly airplanes? You've been in an airplane? Raise your hand right now. How many of you have ever lost your luggage? Raise your hand, please. Raise your hand. All right, very good. Now, how many of you, if you knew your chances of getting to your next destination were as good as your luggage, would you still get on an airplane? No, no hands went up. You know why? 
You know how you can get on the airplane where your luggage is supposed to go and you show up and your luggage does not show up? Because the airline has made human cargo getting to the destination important, more important than the luggage. Aren't you glad? <laughs> she said, yeah, I ain't gonna fuss no more. So as you begin to look at life, as you begin to look at the things you want to do, decide that you're going to become the active force in your life. Decide that you're not going to go through life feeling like a victim. Decide that when things become challenging, and they are, that you're not going to personalize it, that you're going to look at it, and you do whatever you must do in order to work things out and learn from it. Learn from it. That's the key. I like what Charles Udall said. He says, in life, you will always be faced with a series of God-ordained opportunities, brilliantly disguised as problems and challenges. If you've lost your job, don't say that I've been laid off. Just say, I've been given an opportunity by the universe to find my life work. So as you view all of the things that happen to you as an opportunity, now you're taking it from a different perspective. Now you become an active force in your life. Now you are the one, rather than running from things as they begin to change, you become a change driver because you know that you've got the power within you to make the difference. This force, this power, this energy that you have, that's more powerful than anything that can ever happen to you. You're more powerful than your circumstances or anything that you can experience right now. Decide that you're going to commit yourself to act on your ideas, to become happy. Commit yourself to live your dream. Commit yourself to become the architect of your future. There's something that I heard that Goethe wrote that I love very much. And, and it really, as you begin to, to operate out of this consciousness, you begin to experience a different level of living in terms of commitment. He says, until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. See, until you are willing to jump out there, somebody asked me, how do I do that? I said, no, 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 no. You don't need any answers now. You need to make the commitment. Once you make a commitment, then life will give you some answers. You can't decide just going to sit on the side of the pool and just stick your toe in. No, you've got to be willing to make the leap. Most people don't want to do that. They want to sit on the side and, and say, tell me, is it cold out there? Is it rough out there? Come on out and see. See, no, you want to decide to make that commitment because then that's when you begin to become involved in the learning process. He said, concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there's one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans, that the moment one commits oneself, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never have otherwise occurred. He said, whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, magic in it. Begin it now. I read a book by Dr. Johnny Coleman that says, it works if you work it. And as you begin to look at your life, decide that you're going to start working on that dream. You're going to work and nurture that idea. Now, there will be people that will criticize you. There will be people that won't see it for you. But I say to you, don't let them turn you around. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, don't let nobody turn you around. Yeah. That's key. Because people will try and turn you around. Hello? People will try and turn you around. But when I heard Bob Mays out of Chicago sing that song, don't let nobody turn you around, that's real. Because that's why most people don't act on their dreams and ideas. That's why most people, when I'm talking with kids that are in institutions, and I said, what happened? Why, why did you give up working hard and making good grades? Well, they started teasing me. And they allowed that peer pressure to cause them to scale down their dreams and their ambitions. They started following the crowd. That's why many people don't do the things they want to do. A friend of mine, he wanted to become an actor all his life. He let someone convince him, you can't become an actor. You go out to Hollywood, they'll swallow you up. It's too competitive. Thousands of unemployed people out there. But then another friend of mine, Sheila Hall, 
And she decided at age 42, I'm going to live my dream. Her son graduated from high school. She decided to make the plunge to go to Hollywood, quiet person, never had any experience in the area. And because she decided to make the commitment, she is now working on a one woman show. And she's been getting support from everywhere because she was willing to make the commitment. This other guy is far more talented and skillful, but he wasn't willing to make the commitment. So he goes to work every day to a job that's making him sick because he doesn't have the guts or the boldness to stand up in life and say, I'm going to live my dream. I'm going to commit myself to live out what's in me. I heard Dr. Johnny Youngblood say, I must live what's in me. I said, why do you do this? He said, I got to do it. I got to do it. And I'm saying, find something in your life that you say, hey, it might not work out, but I got to do this. Why? Hey, it's the one thing I love. It's my piece. It's my thing. You don't understand it? It's all right. <laughs> it's all right. You don't need anybody to understand it. You don't need anybody to approve you. You don't need anybody to say, go ahead on and do it. If you get that, that's fantastic. If you get that encouragement, that's great. But I say stand up within yourself boldly and say, this is my life. I'm controlling my destiny. Dude, it is so good to have you. You are an unparalleled motivational preacher. And, and I use that word very intentionally. You have a way of conveying a message with such chills-inspiring, goosebump-giving power. It's really, really extraordinary to witness and becomes all that much more powerful knowing that you didn't start there that that wasn't sort of naturally, you know, your your beginning. And you've called life a, a battle for territory. Yes. What do you mean by that? That the things that you get in life, you know, Frederick Douglass said, we might not get everything that we fight for, but everything we get, it will be a fight. <laughs> so, and I love the quote that life is a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over. Like getting ready to come here to see you I want to just, first of all, thank you for the great work that you're doing. I watch you and I study you and you have had some incredible guests that impacted my life and, and preparing to come here. I'm being treated uh, by uh, Cancer Centers of America for fourth stage cancer, which I've been kicking cancer's butt for 27 years. And I've been working on getting a six pack before getting here. <laughs> I still got one pack. <laughs> But I, and I've been working to get some muscles so I can wear my T-shirt, but they weren't large enough, so I wore a long sleeve. <laughs> That's amazing, man. Talk to me about cancer. You've had such an upbeat attitude about it. It's really pretty extraordinary. Was that your initial reaction? Did you go through a trough of despair when you first got diagnosed? Like, how have you framed that? Dr. Alfred Golson, uh, who has since passed, was a very unusual guy. And he told me, he said, Mr. Brown, you have cancer. I said, can you give me a second opinion? He said, yes, and you're ugly too. <laughs> I said, oh my God. <laughs> so I didn't have a chance to, to, to have fear because the, uh, those three words, you have cancer, three of the most feared words in seven different languages. I saw it as a fight. And, and, and from that time to this time, you know, my PSA was 2,400, and that stands for prostate-specific antigen, and, and now it's below zero, and metastasized to seven areas of my body, which was a good thing, because seven is my lucky number, <laughs> okay? So, it, the, no, I, I, I never was fearful that I was going to die from it, and, and I think that I read something by Dr. Norman Cousins. He wrote a book called The Biology of Hope, and he talked about the fact that when something happens to you, you don't deny it, you defy it. And I was defiant that I'm going to beat this, I'm going to handle this. That there are people who many times when something happens to them, that they embrace it from a place of fear and it takes them out. And, 
Elsie Robinson said, things may happen to you and things may happen around you, but the most important things are the things that happen in you. And you have to stand up inside yourself and deal with it and handle it. So fortunately, that never bothered me, but I had sciatica pain. That had me speaking in unknown tongues. <laughs> And I was in a wheelchair for several months, speaking from the wheel, a wheelchair. And it was something that I, I dealt with that frightened me. Will this ever end? It was 24 hours. I lost a lot of sleep. It was exhausting going from all types of specialists in and out of the country. And just one day, it stopped. And I'm glad that I'm past that, you know. I just, I, I feel like uh, when, you, when you go through some stuff, you just, there's some certain things that you don't want ever to see again, and that's what I don't want to ever see again. But fear has not been the biggest challenge that I've faced with the things that I've been dealing with in terms of my health. Well, talk to me about the process that you go through mentally. So there have been a few times in your life in getting to know your story where, they seem like really key inflection points. Um, being told that you were teachable but mentally retarded, that for sure is something that would define most people and they would have a hard time escaping that. Um, being told that you have cancer, that it's stage four, that um, they don't know how to treat it, like that's something that consumes most people. How do you build that resilience? So maybe by the time you get to cancer, you've already done so much work, so I get maybe how that one you're you're protected by the mechanisms you've built but in the beginning how did you crawl out from under the labels that people were putting on you the easiest thing i've done was to get out from under the labels and to live the life that i live the most difficult thing i've ever done was to believe that i can do it what's the difference uh, the difference is that when you don't know what's impacting you and it's it's something that that's holding you down and you're not aware of it. Of the great anthropologist Margaret Mead was in a restaurant in London and, and a guy was serving her and said, there's several Americans here tonight. And she said, is that right? Yeah, so let me know when you serve them dessert, I'll tell you exactly how many are here. He said, oh, you couldn't possibly. And so he came back and said, okay, I've done it. And she got up and she walked around and she came back and she said, there are around 25 here. And he looked at the roster. How did you know that? Say, in America, we eat differently from you when we eat a dessert. You eat it from the crust toward the tip. We eat it from the tip toward the crust. When you eat a slice of pie, how do you eat yours? Uh, definitely, yeah, from the, the tip back to the crust, for sure. Yeah, okay, and so, so there are things that when you, in, in my situation, when you live in a dominant culture that is designed to destroy your sense of self and your belief in yourself, and, and you have to learn ways in which you can begin to connect with this power that you have within yourself to handle where you are. The key is to be constantly in a perpetual process of discovering the truth of who you are and fighting constantly to look for ways in which you can escape the inner conversation. I speak to audiences around the world and I, and I train speakers as well and I, I tell them that when you speak that there's, a, there's an objective that you want to achieve when you speak to an audience because how people live their lives is a result of the story they believe about themselves. So you as a speaker, when you speak in this program, when people see you, what you do is distract, dispute, and inspire. You distract people from their current story with your guests and the questions that you ask through the process of the ongoing questioning and the way in which they respond and the things they have learned, you dismantle their current belief system and inspire them to, to create a new chapter with their lives. And so, but that's an ongoing process of, of constantly interrupting that conversation, what psychologists call your self-explanatory style, because life is, is gonna beat up on you in so many ways, and many things, they come back, you know, negative thoughts and, and how you feel about yourself, they don't die. They, they come back once you stop doing the maintenance work on your mind. 
listening to motivational messages, going to seminars and workshops, spending time quietly listening to the still small voice within. Uh, who am I really? Is this really me? Am I giving my best? Uh, am I just reflecting what's around me? Because all of these various things affect how we show up in life. And so having a strategy to continuously uh, find ourselves reaching higher. Robert Shuler had a book, is not very popular, but I loved it. It's called Peak to Peak, U-P-E-A-K to P-E-E-K because you're constantly reaching higher to find out and discover your, your better self. One of the things you mentioned as I, as I was listening to you is a person, Mr. Washington, that shaped your life. I have a twofold question. We know one of the individuals who shaped your life was Mr. Washington. Another one was Miss Mamie Brown. Um, but what has shaped your life? The desire to make my mother proud. I'm talking to mm. you because of two women. One gave me life, the other one gave me love. God mm. took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. And so my mother, as a kid, she's my hero. You know, Father's Day came around, I gave her a Father's Day card too because she was not just my mother, but she served as a father as well for seven children that she did not give birth to. And I always wanted to do something to make her proud. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna talk talk about greatness just for a moment. What has been your greatest life lesson? That there, there are things that you can do that you don't know that you can do. Mm -hmm. That's why the book of life says, I has not seen ear has not heard. Mm -hmm. I never saw myself speaking in the stadium before 80,000 people. Mm -hmm. I never saw myself standing on a stage in Poland to 30,000 people and over 51 different countries. Those are things that I accomplished that I did not see coming. When I realized that there are things that we can do and things that we can achieve that we cannot see. And because we cannot see does not mean we cannot do it. That's why we're taught to lean not unto thine own understanding. That mm -hmm. we've been programmed and indoctrinated with a mindset to be logical, practical, and realistic. But when you step out of your history, your mindset, and live from your heart, where your heart is there, your treasure is also, that that transports you to begin to live out of your imagination. Mm. And Einstein said the imagination is the preview of what's to come. Mm -hmm. And so, and it takes discipline and persistence to do that. That's what's required to get out of your head and into your greatness and, and to live and to do the greater work.